Amen. We want to jump right into the Word this morning because uh, it's first Sunday, then we're going to be having our communion. We're going to be celebrating communion um, at the back end of the message. So wherever you find yourself, if you did not come by the church to pick up elements, we want to make sure you get you some juice, crackers, bread, whatever you need to do within your home so we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So you want to allow God just to move and have his way uh, with us this morning. So today we are on the back end is the term I'm going to use, the back end of a series that we've been in for quite some time, I believe five weeks to be specific. And today we're going to culminate that, just culminate what it means to be a part of the Elijah generation. So I want to share some things with you. I want to share some things that I believe is critical to the body of Christ. So let us look to God for a word of prayer. And I want you to grab your Bibles, and we're going to go to the book of 1 Kings. We will be dealing with chapter 18 of 1 Kings in its entirety. A lot of verses, but we're going to spend some time to abstract up and just kind of move through it to allow God to move and have his way. So bow your heads with me in a word of prayer and let the Holy Spirit, we can let the Holy Spirit move. Father, we thank you for you. You're an awesome God. You're a wonderful God. You are gracious, phenomenal, mighty God. So Lord... Holy Spirit, as we go to your word this morning, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. God, we know there's nothing you can do. We know you to be a great God. And, and I just really appreciate the worship experience because then it, it, it reamplifies and it recommunicates the greatness of God. So Holy Spirit, as we go to your word, open our hearts this morning to hear. Open our hearts to be in tune. Open our hearts to adjust, God. So, Holy Spirit, we can just hear from you. Speak through me. Felix dies, as I say every Sunday, and I just want to reiterate that truth. We move ourselves out of the way so, God, that you can be glorified. So, Holy Spirit, just bless. Thank you for what you're going to do this morning, God. I'm praying that as the word goes forth, that it would touch a soul. It would encourage somebody to be more of who you would have them to be. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles, the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, we're going to be dealing with that in its entirety. And I'm just going to um, encourage you this, this morning in your own way to make sure you spend some time reading that text over and over to get it into your spirit so we can hear more of what God has, is doing. Last week, we spent a little bit of time, I'm going to say, speaking to maybe more leadership is the term I'm going to use. Uh, but today, I want to speak to more of the body of Christ, individual members of the body of Christ. I think there's a word that God has for us um, that people who are part of the Elijah generation, I'm going to say people who are called out from, by God to be separate from the world. And that's the church. That's all of us. That's you. That's I. That's those of us that have accepted Christ into our life as personal Lord and Savior. Uh, we want to talk about as we prepare to re-engage. This should be just the state of the church in all shape, forms, and fashion that we would be who God would have us to do. Now here's today. Uh, we're going to talk about the whole concept of preparing for the rain. I just wonder if anybody's out there, out there is ready for just God to move. Come on, just ready for God to just be God again. Amen. He, I mean, he never stopped being God, but for the church of God to really take, it, take its rightful place and begin the process of doing everything that God is going to do. Listen, I don't know who you're sitting by, but if you're sitting next to a person, even if you're standing by yourself, point to yourself and say, self, say, get ready for the rain. Amen. Get ready for the rain. Let me just say this by way of a, a, a short, short review because I have a lot to share this morning. I want you all to get this. We've been talking about this series of the Elijah generation. The big idea has been this, right? Choose the big G, big God, not the small gods of the world. And, and, and the, the whole premise of that is that God wants us to be committed to him and not be so much sold out to the small things that takes the place of God. And that's premise in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, where God says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, that you ought to have no other God before me. Our focus, our, 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 our theme, our premise ought to be the worship of God. And, and what we've been dealing with in this series is the whole issue of where God said to Elijah, I need you to go to Ahab and declare to him that, 
because Ahab sinned, had so grieved God. He was the worst king that ever lived at the time of the text. And God sent Elijah to go to Ahab and say to him, it's not going to rain unless the Lord says so. And the whole premise of that is that Ahab and Jezebel had set out to make the worship of Baal on par with God. And as you're going to see in a little while as we come to the back end of this, the people themselves, the very people of God, had become confused as to who the true God really is. And this really is a battle of the gods. And if I were to subtitle this message, I was tempted to really call it the showdown on Mount Carmel, right? With the battle of the gods between gods. But then when we get to the text today, some time has elapsed. And I want to encourage you Go back to our podcast, go back to our YouTube channel, go to our website, go to the RCF Network, and listen to the four series, sermon series on Elijah before this, if this is your first Sunday joining us. But I want to pick up at the end, because it's been three years since there was no rain on the land. It's been three years since the drought has taken place. It's been three years since the world had found themselves in the place that they're in. And, and if you're like me, man, it, it feels as if we've been on this stay-at-home lockdown for about three years. <laughs> it seems like a long time. It really, really does. And, and, and God is about to, some things are about to change and things are about to reopen again. And when we get to the text, look with me at chapter 18. I want to read um, just the first few verses, then I'm going to talk through a couple of this so we can hear what God is saying. Look at what verse 18, verse 1 of chapter 18 says. After many days, and I'm in the ESV, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab, I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went and showed himself to show himself to Ahab, and, and it says here parenthetically, now the famine was severe in Samaria. Now, what's striking about these two verses is that we, we saw before that Elijah was by the brook, and we saw him, God sending him to Zarephath when the brook dried up, and we saw him providing oil and flour for the woman at Zarephath, and we saw him raising that woman's son. Now, we don't know how long he stayed there, but what we do know, it's been a span of three years on the earth at that particular point in time until rain, since rain had fallen on the earth. And God was about to raise the curse. God was about to raise some things up and cause rain to come back in the land again. And the impact of this famine was serious because my Bible says in verse 2 that the famine was very severe in Samaria. So God says to Elijah, hey, Elijah, I'm about to fix some things. I need you to go to Ahab and tell him what I'm about to do. Now, let me just narrate verses 3 on down because Elijah sets off to find Ahab. And in the whole time, if you were to read this, and we don't have time to read all of this, Ahab calls his administrator, his palace administrator, administrator or his executive pastor, and he said, let's go figure out how we're going to solve this thing, right? So they split up ways. They go their separate ways. Elijah's on, the, on, on his journey to do what God calls him to do, and he bumps into Obadiah, and he gives word to Obadiah to say to go to Ahab and tell him that God is sending me to communicate a word to uh, King Ahab because it's about to rain. And so now jump all the way down to verse 17. When we get to verse 17, I want you to notice with me that Ahab and Elijah finally meets up. Now notice the text. It says, and Ahab said to Elijah, Ahab, uh, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, it, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And listen to what he answered. I have not troubled Israel, but here's the story here. But you and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. This is interesting. This is interesting because for three years, 
there's been no rain on the land. For three years, there's been famine. And then all of a sudden, Ahab bumps into Elijah, and here's what he says to him. Hey, Elijah, it's because of you that we're in this mess. Because of you, that it's been three years since it hasn't rained. And here's what Elijah's response says. No, no, brother, don't get it twisted, all right? Get it straight. God stopped the rain because of what you and your father's household has been doing. And I wish I had time to review all of that, but I don't. But he has caused some things to happen that has impacted the land. And Ahab, I mean, Elijah wanted the record to reflect clearly that God is about to make it rain. But before he does, there must be a battle of the God because the people need to know who the true God is. So look at, verse, look at verse 20 as I kind of move through this to get to where we need to go. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to, near to all the people and said, now watch this, watch this with me, people. How long, he said to them, will you limp? That's my translation. Some of your translation may say halter at verse 21. Some, if you're in a King James, a new King James, it may be say waver. How long will you limp between two differing opinions? I like this. If the Lord is God, in other words, if Yahweh is Elohim, he says, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And, and look at this last phrase. And the people did not answer him a word. Now, 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 let me take two minutes here because this is troubling to me. So here's the challenge, right? Ahab came on the scene and Ahab and Jezebel had set this thing up for the people of God, the people that were called by God, and they were trying to make Baal worship equal to the worship of Yahweh Elohim. And here's what the people were doing. They were straddling the fence. One day, they would want to worship God. The next day, they would want to worship Baal. So it was almost as if we want to worship God when it's convenient, and then they would leave the worship of God, and then they'd want to worship Baal when it's convenient. And, and here's the challenge. They, they missed the point that the reason God stopped it from raining was because of his people straddling the fence. I need to put a parenthetic here because, church, you need to hear me say to here today, God does not want his people straddling the fence. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want that because here's, here's what we want to do. We want to have our cake and we want to eat it too. We, we want to worship God when it's convenient, but when everything is going well, we want to forget the worship of God and we want to worship the bell. Here's what it looks like. Whenever you've got money in your pocket, we act like we don't need God. Come on now. And we want to do everything that the world wants done. But let us lose our job here. Oh, Lord, I need you. And we want to come and cry out to God. Let sickness strike our body. Oh, Lord, we need you. Come on. Let calamity come in your home. Oh, Lord, we need you. And then when God steps in and heals, we want to forget about him. And so here's, here's Elijah. How long, people of God, are you going to halter or limp between two opinions? Then he, he lays this challenge out. If Yahweh Elohim is God, then worship him. But if Baal thinks he can outdo God, then forget God and worship him. Now here's my problem with the text. The people said nothing. Church, that's troubling to me. Because these weren't a people that had no history of the faithfulness of God. These were the same people that God delivered from Egypt. These were the same people that he had in the wilderness for 40 long years and he provided for them. These were the same people, come on, that he fed bread and, and manna. These were the same people that he parted the Red Sea. These were the same people that he crossed the Jordan. These were the same people that that pillar of cloud protected them by day and the pillar of fire by night. These were people who had a testimony to the faithfulness of God. The least they could have then is they could at least say, well, God, I mean, Elijah, we want to commit to God, but they kept quiet. And the reason that's so troubling to me, because that's our story today. Come on, y'all. That, that's our story. Come on, can we be honest? When, when we are confronted with whether we should choose God or not, we are silent 
and we're afraid to open our mouth and say, as for me and my house, in the word of Joshua, we're going to serve the Lord. But the text says, these people kept silent, meaning that Ahab and Jezebel had so influenced them, they had so scared them, that they did not know what to say. Look at verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet to the Lord. Let, let me pause there. He said, y'all can stay quiet all you want. <laughs> I'm not going to hold my peace because I know what God did for me. And then, and then look at this. Look at this. And he says, and, and, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And look at the challenge now. So let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire on it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire on it. Verse 24. And you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And I like this. And the God who answers by fire. Lord have mercy. Oh, Jesus. He is God. Now watch this. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. The same folk. So, so here, here's what they're saying now. Wait, wait, wait. Elijah said, choose who you're going to serve. And they shut up because it's like they didn't know what to say or who to choose. Then all of a sudden he says, we're going to put a challenge out. And the real God, the true God, the one sovereign God is going to rise to the occasion. So we're going to give Baal some stuff to do. And we're going to give God some stuff to do. And then we're going to find out who the true God is. Here's what they said. Sounds like a good idea to me. And the sad commentary is that church. And then we're going to, I want to walk through this set. We, as a people of God, seem as if we want to compare God with the things of the world. As if we don't know who the true and living God is. What a sad commentary. Come on, I want y'all to hear this morning. So, so notice, so, so they said that it's good, it's a good idea. So, so let me narrate this part because I, I don't want to spend time on this. So Baal gives, I mean, Elijah gives them the opportunity. And I, I wish because this is hilarious to me. He, he says to them, go ahead and take your cow. I mean, let me go on this side. This is Baal's side here. And, and set it up. And, and, and they built this altar, and they set it up, and they put the cows on it. And he said, don't, put, don't light the fire. Don't do nothing on it. All I want y'all to do, all 450 of y'all prophets of Baal and all 400 of y'all prophets of Asherah, cry out to your God and dare him to come down and burn that wood. Put your matches away. Put your flints away. Dare God, dare your God to speak. And what's funny about this is those guys prayed all day. They prayed, well, like the song would say, they prayed and they prayed. <laughs> they prayed all night long. <laughs> they prayed and they prayed, and no fire still did not come down. And, and Elijah is over here looking, and here's Elijah. Maybe your God's sleep. Maybe your God's on vacation. He even, he even got funny on them. Maybe he's in the bathroom. <laughs> It's in the text. Come on, read it. He, he is clowning them because their God now is unable to make fire come down. Now, now, now watch this verse. Watch this verse because they tried and nothing happened. Then it says here, and as midday pass, they travel on, verse 29, until the time of the offering of the oblation or the evening offering, but there was no voice. No one answered and no one paid attention. Let me say this parenthetic before I move to the second part. Listen, people, the gods of this world are inanimate. They have nothing to offer. They can't provide for you. They can't bring life. Only the one true and living God can do that. And he wants the people that are part of this Elijah generation to go to the world and to say to them, only God can give life, and we need not miss that. Only God can give life. So after Baal and his 450 prophets and Asherah and her 450 pride tried, here's what Elijah said. All right, y'all, it's my turn. My turn. And, and let me read. Let me read. I, I want to read this part in its entirety, and then we're going to talk to it. So then Elijah, look at verse 30. Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. 
And he repaired the altar of the Lord that has been thrown down. Then Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two sheets of seed. And he put the wood on the altar and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water. Pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation or the evening offering, Elijah the prophet came there, came there and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Verse 37, answer me, O God, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Watch this now. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. Now they want to talk. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them, he said, escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Now, let me, let me say this, and then I want to give you some application, because I don't want to spend time on what's going on here. Elijah builds his altar, and he puts the bull on it, and he puts wood on it. And then what's striking is he drenches it with water to make sure that there is no flame sitting there. And then he cries out to God, God, you rain down fire. And God comes and he doesn't only consume the sacrifice. He burns the wood. He burns the rock. He burns. All, come on, y'all. He, he, he shows them, show enough that he is God in the midst of it all. And he consumes this. And watch the, watch the people. Watch the people. Man, Baal, you couldn't do that? This is God. This is God. This is God. And then all of a sudden, the people are saying, this is God. Now, 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 now church, I, I could spend a lot of time on that, but, but this is a story that happened many, many years ago. And this whole Elijah generation thing is something that happened many, many years ago. But I want you to see just for a moment as I share some things with you in this text that the same thing Elijah did, you and I have the ability to do today so when people see me and when they see you, they can say, there goes a person of God. There goes a child of God. There goes a son or a daughter of God. But, but I want you to see the, the, the steps that Elijah took because I think those steps have application for me and application for you today as we are on the end of this pandemic, that as we go into the world, when people see you and when they see me, they can refer back to the story and say, the same God who did that for Elijah then is the same God that's doing it today it's the same God so I want to share I want to share seven things with you and I'm going to move quick I want to share seven things with you seven steps that as we're about to re-engage culture that 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 will let us to see who the new Elijah generation is look at the first thing look at the first thing I want to show you some application look at thing number one here's the first thing I want you to understand watch what Elijah did number one we must return to a proper worship of God. I'm going to say it again. The church and the people of God must return, number one, to a proper worship of God. Here it is. You can't alter, halter between two opinions. It cannot be Baal or God. It's got to be one or the other. And I want to show you today that God wants to be one. Okay, so notice what Elijah did. The first thing he did, look with me at verse 30, the first thing. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near me. And the people came near him. And watch what he did. He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Church, hear me. And then we're going to move. The world 
The enemy has been on a rampage to tear the altars of God, the places of worship, the church of God, the people of God. And as a person of God, number one, like Elijah, if we want the world to see who God is, number one, we must return to a proper worship of God. And the way we do that is we rebuild the altar. We rebuild the altar. We rebuild the places of worship. We tear down the places where Baal worship of Baal took place, and we rebuilt the altar. The altar is symbolic of us getting back to the place where God is first on our li- in our lives. It's getting back to the place where all glory belongs to God. It's getting back to the place where everything we do, number one, is all about God. We must, number one, return to a proper worship. Now, if you're going to go back to worship, here's what it looks like. Look at number two. Look at the second thing that we've got to do, right, if you're going to return. We must reclaim the name that God has assigned us at the point of salvation. Let me read, let me read 31 and 32, then I'll explain. Look at the second thing Elijah did. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the 12 tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord has come, saying, Your name, Israel, shall be your name. This is quick, number two. Okay? Uh, reclaim the name. Here, before God did, did a work in, 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 to change his name to Israel, his name used to be Jacob, trickster, swindler, supplanter. And God changed his name to say, now your name will be called Israel, meaning God will fight for you. Here's the thing. A lot of us have been saved so long, we forgot what our God-given name is. And here's what happened. We We revert back to who we used to be versus who God has made us. Right? So here's, here's what he did, right? He, he took these stones and he rebuilt the names. Let me show you. Let me show you. Put that next slide up. I want y'all to see what these names mean, okay? And, 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 and take some moment to review. Here's the 12 tribes. Re, Re, Reuben, God has seen my misery. This is before you got saved. Here's what Reuben meant. Look at Simeon. God has heard that I am not loved. This is what it used to be like when, when Leah was going through what she was going through. And, and, and God wanted to show his love. Look at the next one. My husband will be attached to me. God wants to let you know that he's connected you. Look at Judah. I will praise the Lord. We've got to get back to a place of praise. Look at Dan. God has vindicated me. You've got to realize you didn't save yourself. God did it for you. Naphtali, I struggled and I won. (laughs) And and don't make the mistake into thinking you did it yourself. God did it for you. Look at the next ones. Come on, go to the next slide. I want to see it. Okay, look at that. What good fortune is, that's God, right? Asher, God will call, people will call me happy, not because you're serving Baal, but because what God has done in you. Look at Issachar, God has rewarded me. Look at Zebulun, I have a home with my husband. Look at Joseph, God has taken away my disgrace. You got to realize who you are today is not who you used to be yesterday. If anyone is in Christ, the old has gone, the new has come. Look at Benjamin, okay? We are now a prince of God. Rebuild, reclaim, restore the name that God gave you at your salvation. Hear me if we're going to get to this, okay? That's number two. Look at number three, and then let's walk through this. I want you all to stay with me. Come on, put the third thing up. Let's kind of walk through this, okay? Here's what the thing says. We must allow God to work his sanctification process. In our lives. Let me, let me read. Let me read. Look, look at the first part of verse 33. Okay. And he put the wood on the altar. And then he cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. Here's what sanctification is. God growing me. God working in me. God cleaning me up. God preparing me. So here's what it sounds like. Who I am today is not who I was yesterday nor is it who I'm going to be tomorrow. So on the journey, as I go in this journey as part of the Elijah generation, my prayer is be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. So we continue on the journey to sanctification. I want you to see the steps because these are some transitable things and principles we can apply to our life. Look at the fourth thing real quick. Look at the fourth thing I want you all to see as we kind of walk through this. Allow the Holy Spirit to dominate our lives, right? Look look at what verse 33 says. Look at verse 33. And he put the wood on the altar, cut the the pieces, 
uh, the bull in the pieces, laid it on the wood, and he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering, not on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And he said, they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. And he ran, the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. You might have missed it. Water in Scripture, especially if you go to John chapter 4, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And here's what I want you all to get from that. Don't think that all you need is just, I got saved, and then I got spirit filled, and I'm good for the rest of my life. Do it a second time. <laughs> and, then, and then when you get weak, do it a third time, right? And, and look at the text. And don't just do it one or two times. Make sure it overflows. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. The reason I sin and the reason I mess up is when I stop inviting the Spirit to permeate my life. And I walk in the flesh, so I, I walk in the Spirit, so I don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. So I need to continually be prayed up and focus on God every morning. God, fill me with your Spirit. In the noonday, God, fill me with your Spirit to overflow people of, a, of the Elijah generation need to be a spirit filled people where everything we do is what God wants done in us look at the fifth thing as you want to walk through this and, 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 and we're going to make these available on our website so you can get that and so here's the thing prayer then must be an integral part of our everyday life I'm going to say it again Prayer, number five, must be an integral part of our everyday life. Look at, look at verse 36. Watch what he says. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Oh, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God of Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, he said, Oh, Lord, answer me. That the people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Here's prayer. I wake up in the morning, God, fill me. Wherever I find myself, God, let people see you in me. So God, kill Felix so they don't see Felix but they see you in me, in my ministry. If, if, if I'm singing, if I'm leading worship, God, kill Tiffany so they don't see Tiffany, but they see God in me. Come on, I want, if I'm playing the keyboard, Lord, kill JB so they don't see JB, but let them see God in me. Come on, if I'm playing the drums, God, kill Cedric so they don't see Cedric, but they see God in me. If I'm playing the bass, God, kill Jerome so they don't see Jerome, but let them see God in me. That's my prayer. So wherever I find myself, just like Elijah, they see God, they don't see me. They see God, they don't see me. They see God, they don't see They see God. If the church is going to resurface, the world wants to see God. They don't want to see the church no more. They're tired of seeing us. They want to see God. So prayer ought to be so people can see God in us. Look at number six. Look at number six. Look at the sixth thing, Okay. And then we must allow God to purify us so the world, I just said this, can do what? See him in us. And so, so watch what happened, right? Look at verse 38. Then the fire of heaven filled and consumed the burnt offering and the stones, uh, the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Let me say this real quick. Y'all ever put your hand on fire? Man, that sucker hurts because it burns. When God starts to cut things away from you and burn things away from you, I'm not going to lie to you and say it's going to feel good. <laughs> and the reason a lot of us don't go through the burning process is because we don't like losing the things that God wants to take away. And the reason he takes it away is because the thing, listen to this, has become little gods in our lives. And he's not going to continually put us in battles where, we're compete, where he's competing with the little gods. He will burn it away so he can get the glory out of it, okay? So allow God, allow God to purify, allow him to work in you. Look at the last thing real quick I want to share with you, okay? And the thing is that when God does these seven things that he's going to do, sixth thing, here's the thing. We must be willing to completely destroy all the influences. That's an ouch, 
we must be willing to completely eliminate all the influences. Look at, look at verse 40. And, say, and Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishron and slaughtered them there. This is the rough part, people. When God brings you out, all influences got to go. Okay? Don't let those prophets live. The prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And he killed every, excuse the grammar, last and one of them. Why is that critical? If God delivered you from alcohol, you can't continually go to the liquor store. You got to kill that. If God delivered you from drugs, you can't keep hanging out with the old buddies. You got to kill that. If God delivered you from pornography, come on, I'm going to be real with you. You can't continually go to your favorite secret YouTube channel, secret whatever. You got to kill that. Whatever it is God has delivered us from, if it's clothes, if it's an addiction, if it's a stronghold, whatever it is, our places of deliverance, we cannot continue to hang out there and expect God to grow us. We've got to release some things. Listen to me. Kill the prophets of Baal. This is why the world calls us hypocritical. We claim deliverance, but we look like we hadn't been brought out of nothing. If anyone is in Christ, the scripture says, you ought to be a new creation. The old ought to be gone, and the new ought to come. And here's the beauty of that. The last thing I want to share as our team comes is that when God does those seven things, hear me, prepare for the rain. <laughs> prepare for the rain. Three years of famine. Three years of drought. And God says to Elijah, go to Ahab and declare it's going to rain. And this battle went down where the Baalites did what they did. And Elijah went through a process. You saw it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the last thing he says, now that God has revealed himself, it's going to rain. Hear me, church. When the people of God are revealed, the sons and daughters of God, Romans 8 says, watch out for the rain. Here's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my face, and pray, I will forgive their sins, I will hear from heaven, and I will do what? Heal their, Heal their land. land. When the church of God stands, I'm going to say this, this pandemic that we're going through, God has control over that. God can heal. God can do whatever. But he doesn't want us to go back to the church needs to look different. Amen. Listen to this. And Elijah said to Ahab, verse 41, Go up and eat and drink. And there is the sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went into the top of the Mount Carmel and he bowed himself down on the earth, put his face to his knees. And he said to his servant, Go on now and look over the sea. And he went and looked. And he said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. Seven times the servant said, Behold, listen to this, a cloud like a man's hand is riding over the sea rising over the sea and he said get up say to Ahab prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you and in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind and there was great rain let me say this and then we're gonna go to our Lord's Supper Elijah said get ready for the rain and watch this when he said that the rain didn't just come pouring down in bundles and in droughts and, and flooded the earth. It started with a little cloud. Sometimes a lot of us miss our blessing because we've been praying for the storm. And we forget the storm starts with a small cloud. And because we ignore the small cloud praying for the big thing, we can never get to the big thing. Hear me out, church. God will bless. God's going to move. But it might start with the small things. And we've got to be okay with the small things. Because in the small things, it's a sign of bigger things that's going to come. Here's how we said it. Faithful over few 
ruler over many. And a lot of us want to rule the many, and we don't manage the few well. What I love about that, when you look at salvation, when you look at Calvary, Jesus could have came with a 10,000 angels. Come on. He could have come riding on a white horse. He could have bring the host of heaven down. But notice how he came small as a baby in a manger. And that small child caused my salvation, caused your salvation, caused the salvation of the world. It's going to rain. But man, you got to rebuild the altar. You got to remember the name that God has given you. I want you to hear me say these things, right? You got to go through God's sanctification process. You've got to go through his purification process. You got to go through all that so that God would move and have his way.